Am I sitting in the right Good place? afternoon. Welcome to the second panel of the University of Virginia Institute of World Languages inaugural symposium. I'm assistant professor of, of Spanish linguistics and philology, Omar Velasquez. The title of this panel is Advanced Foreign Language Literacy and its application to research and scholarly work. Broadly defined, advanced literacy is uh, an advanced mature linguistic state. The following are some of the characteristics of the state. One, the articulation of oral or written language in a fluid, sustained manner. Two, the use of language in a formal, grammatically accurate, and institutionalized way. And three, the use of abstract forms of meaning to represent reality. But is possessing advanced literacy of one or more than one foreign language necessary for teaching the professionals to carry out their own research? How does one acquire languages while engaged in other pursuits that don't directly involve them? How does one gauge the point at which a language is good enough to be useful? Two UVA faculty members join us in this panel, Professor Tyler Joe Smith of the McIntyre Department of Art and Professor Charles Laughlin of the East Asian Languages, Literatures and Cultures Department. They will share with us how they use foreign languages in their professional research and other scholarly pursuits. Tyler Joe Smith is a classical archaeologist who specializes in Greek vase painting and iconography. Her research focuses largely on images of comasts, and I hope I pronounced that right. Perfect. Talking about advanced literacy, right? Or revelers in archaic Greek art and their relationship to drama, religion, and social customs. Her other uh, areas of research include the archaeology of Anatolia and the Black Sea, connections between art and religion, ancient performance, and the history of collecting. Professor Smith has participated on excavations in Greece, Sicily, England, and Turkey. Charles Laughlin specializes in modern Chinese literature, independent and documentary film, and revolutionary and social culture, socialist culture, excuse me. Before joining UVA in 2010, Professor Laughlin taught at Yale University, where he, uh, where he directed study abroad programs in China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Professor Laughlin also directed the Beijing-Yale Joint Undergraduate Program. At Tsinghua University, he also served as director of the Inter-University Program for Chinese Language Studies. I will now begin our discussion by asking a first set of questions to our panelists. As part of our program today, we will later open the floor for questions from the audience. Now we'll tur I will turn to my panelists. Uh, could you please specifically tell us how you use the foreign language or languages you uh, know uh, to carry out your own scholarly work, and if, in your experience, a higher language proficiency is necessary for conducting such work? All right, thank you, Omar. So um, <clears throat> I just want to begin by saying thank you to Cristina de la Caleta for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, and I'm very um, honored to be recognized for having some kind of language ability after all of these many years in the Department of Art History, where I teach visual culture, which is very, very nice, but I don't really get to teach language here at UVA. And I did start life as a language teacher. Um, and I'm very passionate about, about languages, as you're going to learn in the next, uh, the next little bit. Um, that being said, I do look for opportunities to teach language whenever I can. So just last week, I gave uh, introductory conversational Greek lessons to the second grade at my son's school. So just so you know, languages are with me all the time. That was very successful, by the way. So the question is how I use foreign languages to carry out my own scholarly work. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, uh, Omar gave a very nice bio, and I think the bio uh, can tell you, just using your common sense, if I work in all those places, I probably have to speak a lot of languages and use a lot of languages in my work. Just think of the Black Sea uh, as a case in point, or Anatolia. Um, I'm a classical archaeologist, which means I specialize in the uh, 
the ancient, the archaeology of the ancient Greco-Roman world, and we know how big that world, especially the Roman part of it, uh, was as well. In order to become a classical archaeologist, one has to have language, uh, extensive language training. So if a student applies to do a PhD with me or one of my colleagues here at UVA, before we will even look at their application, I mean, before it even gets any consideration at all, they have to have Latin and Greek, I mean ancient Greek, uh, they have to have German, and they have to have French or Italian coming in. Going out, they're going to have all of those languages, so they're gonna get the, the, the Italian, the French, the German, let me make sure I get them all, uh, Latin and Greek, and if they work in a particular country, such as Turkey, Greece, um, Bulgaria, uh, and I could, the list can go on and on and on, they're gonna acquire proficiency at some level in those languages as well. So for a classical archeologist, someone who's engaged in the archeology span of the classical world, languages are the base from which we begin. My language training started very, very young. Um, it started, in fact, at birth. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about myself before I segue into my research, um, because one should never judge a book by its cover. Although my name is Smith, uh, I grew up in a bilingual house. Uh, my mother is uh, Lebanese, Syrian Lebanese, but born in this country, all right? So people talk about generations. We don't talk about generations. It's just way too complicated and way too many cousins are married to each other and all that, all that stuff. <laughs> so I grew up in a house where I heard more than one language spoken, and I grew up in an environment where I heard many languages spoken. I grew up in the center of the country, I grew up in Oklahoma, where more Native American languages are spoken and used than in any other state in the United States. I heard those languages a lot, I heard Spanish a lot, and I heard a lot of other languages as well. So languages have always been there. My undergraduate studies were in classical language and classics. This is the best way to become an archeologist, it's the best path to doing what I do, because you get that fundamental language training. But I was very, very fortunate in my education to be required to study at a very, you know, wee age, we studied Spanish because everybody in Oklahoma learned Spanish when they're little. But from third, the third grade on, I learned French. So I had 10 years of French um, by the time I think I was done with that. Um, and then I started Latin in the seventh grade, which was required and is still required at the school I went to, seventh and eighth and ninth grade Latin. Um, so I had a big, big head start in terms of language acquisition, starting at a very, very young age. You're never too old to learn more languages, don't get me wrong, um, but I did have a huge advantage over a lot of other people. So in terms of carrying out my scholarly work, I went on to study classical archeology, span archeology span being my specialization in the field of classical studies, and I have had to continue using and acquiring languages literally every single day. This is how this works. So yesterday, if I give you yesterday as an example, just yesterday, I was using ancient Greek, uh, modern Greek, uh, German, Italian, uh, doing some research for the book I'm writing right now. So that I'm switching around constantly. Advanced literacy, I do not have. I would be lying to you if I said I have advanced literacy in all of these languages. I have advanced literacy in ancient Greek and Latin, because I have degrees in those subjects, and I have advanced literacy in French but I have a working knowledge of a bunch of other languages, Greek, Turkish, and so on. Um, but I'll talk more about that uh, a, little bit, a little bit later. Well, my story is a little bit different. Um, is it coming through? Okay. My story is a little bit different. Uh, I didn't even really study a for foreign language uh, in earnest until I was in college. Uh, I had no foreign language classes when I was in high school. It was uh, in the public high schools in Minneapolis where I went to school. It was not required uh, to take a foreign language. Uh, but I became interested in East Asia while I was in high school. And so when I was in college, I was following my intellectual interests and decided I, I wanted to learn Chinese uh, to, to get to a deeper level uh, so that I would not have to rely on translations uh, to, to, to look at what I was looking at. At the time, I was interested in Buddhism and Taoism and early Chinese thought. Uh, uh, sort of in contrast with uh, Western intellectual traditions. My, my, my thinking has evolved a lot since then, um, but, uh, but that was how it started. Uh, so I started learning Chinese when I was about 19, 20 years old, and that was really my first uh, foreign language. A lot of people asked me, wasn't it difficult? And I, I can't really answer that question because I was highly motivated to learn the language, and I didn't really care how hard it was. 
Uh, it didn't seem that difficult at the time, but uh, I always, the answer I give to that question is that uh, you have to have a lot of patience and ability to memorize a lot uh, in order to learn uh, Chinese. It's not structurally very complex, but uh, you, have to, uh, you have to memorize and, and learn how to write uh, an enormous amount of Chinese characters, uh, and that takes, uh, that takes some time. Um, now, the, the way the question is framed, it sounds like uh, almost as if I decided on, on my scholarly field first, and then, uh, and, then, and then I needed to assess how much language ability I needed to pursue it, but that's not really how it happened in my case. Uh, I, was, I, just was, I just wanted to learn Chinese uh, when I was in college, and I think a lot of our students, uh, uh, even here at UVA, uh, are the same way. They're, they're not sure exactly why they want to learn Chinese, but, the, but they really want to learn Chinese. They want to go to China. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate, uh, even back in the 80s when I was in college in Minnesota, that I had opportunities to do study abroad in China, uh, which I think was absolutely essential to gaining uh, advanced proficiency uh, in the language. And when I say study abroad, I'm not sure if I have another chance to, to address this topic uh, today. Uh, I don't mean a, a summer program. Uh, I mean a summer program plus at least one semester while you're an undergraduate uh, uh, abroad works best, I think. And in my case, I, I spent a, an academic year uh, after the summer that uh, I spent in China. Uh, so there, there is a level of commitment that, that's required to, to achieve a level of proficiency, I think, especially if you start the language uh, as late uh, as I did. So the question for me was, okay, my Chinese is getting really good. What am I going to do with it? You know, what am I going to do with myself? Uh, and, uh, and I liked my professors at the University of Minnesota a lot, and so they were, they were shepherding me towards an academic career. Uh, and so before I knew it, I was applying for PhD programs in Chinese language and literature uh, and got accepted to a couple, and, and I didn't realize at the time that that basically meant I would have to be a professor of Chinese literature, and I didn't have many other choices for, uh, for my career. Um, and uh, uh, so, so that was kind of how that I sort of backed into, into this career. Um, but I think, you know, in, in my case, maybe uh, more obviously than, than in the case you just heard, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer that you have to have advanced uh, language, literacy and language proficiency uh, to, do, to, uh, to engage in a career in the, in the study of, of Chinese literature. Uh, it's not a very uh, popular career. Uh, it, 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 it really hasn't grown. Surprisingly, I think most of you know that the popularity of the Chinese language has grown immensely uh, in the 30 years since I've been in college. Uh, but the popularity of Chinese literature has grown a little bit, you know, and, and uh, so, so there's a few more jobs out there, but it's, it's not the most popular part of a very popular general field. Um, and, uh, but but uh, uh, it, is, it is extremely important to have uh, this uh, advanced proficiency, and it's something that it's not as if you can just take 10 years of Chinese or 15 years of Chinese to do it. Uh, the, you know, th there have been some years added on to the normal undergraduate course uh, of Chinese. You know, when I was in college, maybe there was fourth year Chinese and then maybe some other classes that were ill-defined. There's sort of readings in literature. Uh, now you, you often have schools that have so-called fifth year Chinese, which is kind of a, a variety of different options you can, uh, you can take, including literature and other things, authentic texts uh, that are non-literary, for example. Um, but after that, you know, it's not necessarily the case that the student coming out of five years of Chinese language training has advanced literacy or advanced proficiency. Uh, so there's a de degree to which a person has to find out how to go to the next level. And there are programs, for example, study abroad programs that can help with that, uh, but a lot of it has to do with the, the person's own ability to teach themselves. And I think that's, a, that's an important aspect of a, of a good language program is to train students to learn how to teach themselves the rest of the language. Because you can only put a small dent in a language, I think, in, in four or five years. Um, so, so uh, for me, uh, studying literature was a very useful and important way to improve my Chinese language ability. One other aspect of uh, advanced Chinese proficiency that has become more and more important in my career is that we have more international conferences on Chinese literature, often held in China. Uh, this is a new phenomenon that wasn't really the case so much in the 80s and 90s. So it's important for us to be able to uh, report our findings in Chinese, to be able to write papers in Chinese and exchange with our uh, colleagues uh, in China and Taiwan and, and other countries. Uh, another example is uh, we have a, 
a lot of people studying Chinese literature in Korea now, uh, and it's much more common that people who uh, in the United States are in this field will be able to com communicate with them in Chinese rather than in English, which they may not, uh, which they may not know. So, so these aspects of scholarly communication are also a very important uh, aspect of why high language proficiency is necessary. And this leads us, leads us to, to the next question, which is, uh, in your opinion, what does it take for one to attain high proficiency or advanced literacy in a foreign language? OK, well, that's a tricky question, I think, to answer, because different languages uh, have different uh, requirements, in a sense, to, to gain this um, advanced literacy, as, as we're calling it. And I think that a lot of it comes from, I think, something Charles just said, which is, is motivation. I mean, being motivated to learn something really doesn't matter what it is, but certainly uh, in this case, that really does help uh, rather a lot, I think. Um, also, people have different abilities with language. I've been hearing all my life, oh, you're good, with la you're good at languages. You're, it's like being good at math. You're good at math. You know, well, I mean, that's true. Yeah, maybe I have a good ear for language. What, I'm really, what I really am is a performance artist. All right, in case you can't tell, I'm a performer. I was, I was trained on the stage um, as, a, as a young child, did a lot of performing, so I, I perform every, every day in my classroom. And a lot of language, uh, using language, is really putting yourself into performance mode. Um, we were talking at, uh, at lunch about this, and I said, well, if I'm working in Turkey, for example, if I'm in Istanbul, I'm dressed a certain way, I'm, uh, my comportment is a certain way, I'm talking about certain things. But if I go to the village where I do archeological work, I'm dressed yet a, different, a very different way. I have, to, I have to have a lot of bags when I, when I travel, a lot of changes of clothes. And I have a, I, I'm speaking in a dialect, I'm using a very, very different type of language and a, and a different vocabulary, and we're just chit-chatting about entirely different things. So uh, a lot of that is, is, is performance in a sense. It's kind of changing your persona a little bit uh, according to your audience and, and trying to communicate. So how do you get, how do you get to that point? Um, I think that immersion is always the absolute ideal situation. I studied abroad in Greece and when I went to Greece, I did not know any Greek at all. I knew ancient Greek, and that was great. I knew the alphabet, I knew ancient Greek. So I had a huge advantage over students who, who didn't have that going on, on study abroad for a semester in Greece. But I didn't know modern Greek at all. And it was required in my course to take elementary modern Greek. It was required to my transcript, so I, I, had, I had to learn that. And that was great. But I had to, I realized when I got back, it was, it was like something that, was, that came up this morning. Uh, someone was saying, what happens when students come back from study abroad? What do we do with these, these students? Well, I was one of those people. I came back and the language I wanted to learn wasn't being taught at the place where I went to college or at many places in the United States. It's hard to, it's hard to study modern Greek. So, so what are you gonna do? How are you gonna attain this literacy? Well, obviously, if you can get yourself back to that country, that's the best thing of all. Go over there, immerse yourself in some kind of uh, language program. If it's German, go to a Goethe Institute, whatever it is, there's, there's these things exist all, all over the place, and that's a wonderful way. But the other thing that I do on an almost daily basis is I practice language. I practice languages all the time. So I have a few, uh, I know a few Greek speakers around grounds, and when we see each other, we speak to each other in Greek. Some of them aren't Greek, like me, they're not Greek either, but we still have that, we form that habit, and it makes it just a very relaxed way of using language and not having, having it be a thing. You know that you have to worry about. You're not. You're not. You know, on the spot. It's just. It, it comes naturally. In other words, so I think, um, in addition to years of study, you know, which I had with French, years of study. So, as a result, my French vocabulary is the best. Maybe my grasp of French grammar is the best. I'm not sure. Greek. I had one semester, and I'd say that my spoken Greek is as good as my spoken French. Now. So different languages require different things, and it, it does depend a little bit on where life, where life leads you. Many points that I might have made have already been made. I, I, I think I'm a bit of a performer myself. I used to play trumpet. That was sort of my identity before I went to college. Uh, I'm comfortable on stage. Uh, even before I was in music, I remember as a child, I was often the one chosen to be the narrator or the speaker, you know, during plays or, or, or performances or, or uh, other kinds of events at church and, and so forth. Uh, so I feel uh, comfortable in, in front of people. And I think, I think that played an important role in my language learning. And, and I often try to 
find some way, and it is puzzling, to convey to students the importance of sort of doing a language, right? Of, 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 uh, uh, of embodying a kind of a persona when you're speaking a foreign language and, 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 and taking off with it, you know, sort of hamming it up a little bit. Uh, because I think the, the students that struggle in, in language classes are often just sort of trying to muddle through a sentence or, or two, and they're not really, you know, filling up their role. Uh, uh, and that helps, uh, I think, accelerate the, the language acquisition uh, uh, experience. Um, uh, you were using the word uh, immersion, which I think is useful, because I said study abroad, and it occurred to me that there are a lot of programs being set up uh, that allow people to be able to go to China, for example, uh, under the rubric of study abroad, but they may not include any, or they may, may not include much language study. Uh, and I think it's extremely important uh, for people who are interested in China and they, and, they, and they have committed or want to commit themselves to learning the language, that they must use that time in China, uh, uh, much of it or, or all of that time, to increasing their, their language proficiency. Uh, and so there's, there's uh, these programs that don't emphasize language proficiency as much, they're good in, in their own way, but I think they should be in tandem uh, with other kinds of programs that focus entirely on, on, on uh, language acquisition. Uh, because it's a little hollow to say, you know, I have a, a you know, global studies background and I spent time in China, but I can only say three sentences in Chinese. It's, it's uh, uh, much better if you can uh, ma master the language to some degree, and, and that, that's really probably one of the best ways to, to make use of that, of that time abroad. Um, so so I, I did want to emphasize study abroad. There's two other things I did want to talk about, though, in relation to literature. Uh, I mentioned before that it, it's not always obvious to people that literature is a useful thing uh, for language acquisition, um, but uh, we find it, uh, it, it works extremely well. Uh, Chinese literature, particularly modern Chinese literature, my field of specialty, is often written in a very clear and standard idiom. Uh, which is uh, uh, useful to many different disciplines and, and fields of, of study. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that it, uh, translation uh, is a practice that also uh, contributes a lot to a high level of literacy in a, in a foreign language. And I think a lot of what's been going on in the evolution of foreign language pedagogy in the last generation or so has tended to uh, marginalized translation because it's an old-fashioned way of going about teaching language. And it is true, before I went to college, a lot of the people who claimed knowledge of Chinese only knew how to translate classical Chinese, and they couldn't speak modern Chinese or, or understand it necessarily. And so we definitely wanted to move beyond that. But if you throw the baby out with the bathwater and use only uh, communicative method and, and, uh, and uh, n never resort to English in the foreign language classroom, uh, I found many cases of students and even professors uh, who, uh, who are fluent in Chinese and their ability to read and converse and understand people, but they, they, they run into a roadblock with translation they, they, because it, it, it's a different set of skills uh, but I think it contributes greatly to, uh, to advanced uh, literacy in the language, which I think is really a legitimate uh, ultimate goal uh, for foreign language acquisition. Uh, and literature, as I was saying before, I think makes a very useful uh, uh, material uh, for translation because it, the subject matter of literature applies to all aspects of human life and all academic uh, disciplines. And that's why this semester I started a, a literary trans modern Chinese literary translation course. Uh, another one of the added benefits to this is that in, in addition to advanced learners of Chinese in the classroom, we also have native speakers of Chinese in the classroom. They can work together to help each other work through the problems of translation. And I think this has all kinds of added benefits it's beyond language acquisition uh, within it. You were talking about cultures and uh, the, you, the usefulness of uh, having advanced literacy within the context of uh, immersion in a country, be it at home or abroad. Uh, do you see language acquisition as a window to gaining a deeper understanding of society, of the society which is the focus of your uh, own research? If so, why? Okay, that's a tricky, that's a great question. Um, a bit tricky in my case since the society I study is, is ancient. So in a sense, I study ancient people, so, you know, that's a little, that's a little hard to, to, to deal with in that sense, that question. But um, I would say that without question, in the countries that I do this research, the countries where I have to go for my field work, let's call it, um, there's no question that 
um, you gain a deeper understanding through language acquisition. Um, this just goes without saying. I'm gonna tell you guys the most depressing phrase for me, the absolute, this just brings me to tears when a student comes in my office and says this. They're gonna go on study abroad somewhere, doesn't even matter where, you know, the Netherlands, let's say. And they say, well, I was over talking to professor so-and-so, and they said, oh, don't worry, everyone over there speaks English. This is the phrase I hate the most. Please don't come in, my, I see a couple of my students here, please don't say this in my office hours. It really deeply upsets me. People go, of course, it really grates on my nerves when it's Greece or Turkey where I work. I say, no, 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 it's, it doesn't work like that. Um, yes, many people, of course, can speak English, and many people can speak very, very good English, but that's not really the point. Um, how do I, what kind of, of cultural insights uh, you know, can I, can I share with you? What kinds of, of windows into the culture have I had through language? First of all, let me say that with, with both Greek and Turkish, I am somewhat self-taught. So that's why I, I could never say I have advanced literacy. That would just be really, you know, embarrassing myself. But I'd say I'm somewhat self-taught in these languages. So let me give you an example. I, I try to work with tutors when I can. And these are tutors here on grounds. I highly recommend this to students um, who want to um, continue learning a language they've already got some working knowledge of. Um, what we learned to do, I was a graduate student in England, and none of us had any money. We were all just as poor as we could be. Um, but all, all, we had to all learn these different languages, and so what we would do is our language exchanges. So um, for a Greek, a Greek student, I would proofread their English you know, writing for their doctoral thesis, and they would give me Greek lessons. And no money was exchanged, but you know, it's a very Greek way of doing things. Um, but it was great. We'd sit, you know, sit over a coffee and, and, and exchange skill sets, in a sense. It's a really, really good way to keep your language uh, training, training up. So about, I don't know, four or five years ago, I started working with a, a Greek graduate student who was here in the classics department at the time. And we sat down for our first you know, tutorial, our first lesson, and she said, so where, where did you learn Greek? And I said, I learned it on the street. And she's like, oh, that's funny. You know, she's very educated, you know, Athenian. And I said, well, okay. You know. So we started talking, we're chatting, and after about five minutes she said, you really did learn it on the street. <laughs> and I said, I know, I'm not joking. I'm, I'm not joking at all. Why could she tell that? Because I could use, I use slang, I use jargon, I don't even know, I didn't even realize it. I thought, this is just the way Greek people talk because I learned from you know, buying things in shops and talking to taxi drivers and this sort of thing. And she kept trying to formalize my Greek. And so I let her do that. I mean, I thought, well, this is important. She's Greek, she's gonna teach me what's what. But I find every time I go back there, I revert to that jargon, I revert to that slang because this is really the way that people, this is really the way people talk. With Turkish, how have I learned Turkish? Of course, living in, in small communities, it necessitates learning the basics of any, any language. Music, I'm pas passionate about music and I'm passionate about Turkish music. If you don't believe me, just friend me on Facebook and you'll see that I love all those Turkish singers. And I, I have learned probably 50% of my Turkish vocabulary from listening to Turkish music and translating Turkish songs. So. It's something that I love, it's something you know, that it's personal to me, but it's also a great way of, of using the language and, and expanding uh, your knowledge base in there. And of course, food, don't even get me started on that. Right. Just now when uh, Professor Smith mentioned music, I thought of how many people who study Chinese uh, end up in karaoke's uh, in, in China, and I think actually that's a, a great window to understanding Chinese society. I mean, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm serious. If you look at contemporary Chinese film by, by you know, uh, celebrated directors like Jia Zhangke, for instance, there's karaoke scenes in almost every movie, and he thinks it's a, it's a very, it, it, it reflects, you know, many things about Chinese culture uh, uh, that we don't see from the textbooks and the scholarly works and, and all of that. Um, in answer to this question, I'd say, uh, it, it, it's kind of hard for me to, to process because it seems to me very obvious that language uh, provides a window to understanding uh, the society which is the focus of, of my research uh, because everything that's the focus of my research is made of language uh, and it, I don't just mean for a literary scholar I mean you know newspapers the media uh, uh, all kinds of uh, stuff is, is made of language but at the same time you can't really conceive of language in abstract, uh, separated from those things, right? Uh, language is all of this, this material uh, that we're looking at. And so it's, it's, in a way, my answer to that question is it's that material that we're looking at, the newspapers, the media, the novels, 
uh, uh, the, the other kinds of, of, of writings or, or linguistic constructs that are the window to gaining a deeper understanding uh, of the society. I guess from the point of view, uh, or in the, in, the, in, the, in the language of language pedagogy, authentic materials are the window uh, uh, through which uh, uh, you gain a deeper understanding of the society, but not necessarily through the language itself if it's taken, uh, uh, if it's viewed separately as, uh, from, from these things that uh, uh, that are constructed of, of language. Um, so uh, well, the other point I wanted to make specifically from the point of view of literature is uh, some, one of the mistakes people make in literary studies, uh, whether they be foreign literary studies or, or English and American literary studies, is that they, they, will, they will view literary texts as, win as reflections of social reality and they'll read literature, whether it be Chinese literature in translation or even in the original Chinese, as some kind of data or information about what's going on in, in China. Uh, and this, this, is, this is very dangerous because uh, the, the, the literary author uh, is an artist uh, and they are using figures and they are distorting and they are refracting their experience. Uh, and so you have to be as alive to the artistic characteristics of the language uh, as you are to the informational data uh, and content uh, aspects of, of the language when you're looking at literary text per se. Uh, so I try to keep people alive to that in, in, in my literature classes. As you can see, many students joined us today. In fact, most of the audience is composed of students. Uh, what advice would you give them? Or would you give those uh, language learners who would like to achieve or attain an advanced command of the language they're studying or languages they're studying? Okay. Uh, there's a couple of things that I would, I would recommend or I, I would advise. First of all, if you go on study abroad, and I hope all of you will, I really you know, cannot recommend that enough. If I, obviously, I've just spent my entire life on study abroad, basically going from one, as archaeologists, we say we plan from one summer to the next. I just got back from semester at sea, which is, was a fantastic experience, um, a sort of study abroad on steroids is what I called it. Um, but if you go on study abroad, don't, don't fall into this kind of study abroad fallacy that I'm, I'm in Italy, um, but are you really? Are you really in Italy? Are you really in Greece? Are you really in China? You know, what, what do I mean? What I mean is I've seen so many American study abroad groups. I see them all these countries where I work, walking around in these packs, you know, from one thing, from one monument to the next or one museum to the next. Um, and, and people being, uh, of course your safety is, is, is first always, but being afraid to branch out a little on their own or in smaller groups to explore the city where they are, explore the culture in, in new ways, like maybe going to hear live music performed or, or something like that. So if you do go on study abroad, no matter where you are, immerse yourself in what's going on around you. Yeah, I'll stick to the program of study that you're supposed to be doing, but when you have free time, use that free time as an excuse to learn more about that culture and its language. I always send my students who study abroad in Greece to church, not just because I'm an Orthodox uh, Christian myself, but because this is a hugely important um, opportunity for you to gain, and, and one that's open to anybody, to gain insight into modern Greek culture and, and more historical Greek culture as, as well, just to use that as, as an example. Um, so th that would be one piece of advice. Don't just stick together, you know, get out, try to talk to people. Be safe, of course, but try to, try to get out there a little bit. The other thing is, don't be afraid to talk to people. So you're abroad, you find yourself in the situation, uh, you're buying something from the little store, you're buying, you know, you ran, out of, you ran out of shampoo and you went there to buy it, or you know, you're in the taxi, or whatever it is that you're doing, use it as a teaching moment for yourself. The person you're talking to just wants to communicate with you. That's all that they want to achieve, right? They don't want you to recite the Gettysburg Address in another language. They, you're just trying to communicate these very, very basic things. It's all about communication. So use it as an excuse to try your ability out and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Every time I open my mouth in any language, I make mistakes, including my own native American English. I studied, in, I studied abroad, I'm abroad, I studied in, in the UK, and I had my English corrected every single day for 10 years, so there, there you have it. Um, but it's, it's true, just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to try to speak to people and don't be afraid to make mistakes. In some languages, in some cultures, 
the instinct of the person talking to you will be to correct you. And you have to just laugh and say, thank you for correcting me, or whatever language is you're speaking. Um, or in others, that won't be the instinct to do that, and people will just let you ramble on. Um, that happens to me in Turkish. People don't ever correct my Turkish, and I know it's, it's often wrong, usually wrong. Uh, but again, what happens as a result of this is you gain confidence. And especially if you have advanced proficiency in one language, so I'm picking mine out to be French, but I don't use French as much as I'd like to in, in my you know, spoken French as much as I'd like to in my work. But knowing that gives me the confidence to try to speak these other languages. I have very little to add to that. That was very well put and, and uh, basically said everything I wanted to say. Just from my own perspective, I, after having only learned a couple of years of Chinese, I started going on study abroad and that greatly accelerated the process. A little bit later, after I'd had maybe four years of Chinese, I started Japanese for reasons of needing to be able to read Japanese uh, for my PhD program, but I never had or never took the chance to do study abroad in Japan. Uh, so I studied Japanese for three and a half years, and I really never got to the ability or confidence to even dare try to express myself in front of a native speaker. I, I went to Japan a couple of times and tried to sort of ask directions and do this or that, and I just stumbled all over the place. And uh, so I knew, I knew much of that was due to the fact, because I was equally motivated, I really loved the Japanese language, um, but uh, if I'd had the chance to spend a lot of time uh, in Japan, it would have made all the difference. Uh, just a couple of you know, different ways to sum up what you just heard, you know, sort of take charge of the process of your own language acquisition. Don't expect other people to make you fluent in the foreign language. Uh, at some point, it's your responsibility, and how, how excellent or you know, how superb you are is gonna more be up to you than up to your teachers. Last suggestion I would have is, uh, uh, and this is something that was true for me, is don't underestimate your ability to read authentic materials in the foreign language. I think in Chinese, for example, after you've passed by the intermediate or advanced intermediate stage, you'd be surprised how easy it is to read uh, contemporary fiction uh, uh, written in Chinese. There'll be some problems, uh, but, but, uh, but, but it's surprisingly similar to, uh, to the spoken language, and it's a great way to expand your vocabulary. And if you run into trouble, instead of using a Chinese-English dictionary, you can use a Chinese-Chinese dictionary because the definitions are often surprisingly easy to understand, except for certain things. And so that's a great way to accelerate your, your literacy. Um, so, so those are things that I think people often overlook uh, and maybe not encouraged to do enough, I think, in, in the language classroom.